where am I? I'm right here. Okay, let me drop this. Uh, drop this in the chat. All right, there we go. <clears throat> Going live. Welcome everybody. Um, yeah, we're missing some. Uh, we're missing some body count here for dang sure. Yeah, we're way down. We're way down. Okay, let's uh, let's get going. We we got. Uh, so let me see. It's Walter here. No, but I have been uh, soundly um, encouraged by uh, Zach and Walter to get my butt moving a little bit because we are. We're a little behind, but we're not crazy behind, okay? We're not crazy, a little bit behind. And we're going to finish this module today, which means that it'll all flip to being due on um, two days later, which will be Thursday. And then we're going to kick into module seven on Tuesday, uh, Thursday. Okay, and then the other thing I just want to say again for repeat is that... Um, <clears throat> the pacing is still actually the same, but there are, the modules are smaller. So it's not like we're speeding up. The pace has been kind of the same, but those modules were bigger. I'm still trying to figure out how to create a more balanced pace on the modules. I'm not completely sure still the best way to do that, but these last modules get smaller, like, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I mean, we have five weeks. We're going to do basically about a, on average about a module a week. Okay. All right. So here's where we're going. We're going to, we're going to crank it. We were talking about, uh, well, actually let me jump ahead. We did real quick. Remember, 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 uh, data movement instructions, right? Where we said that there were, um, different addressing modes and the addressing modes all had to do with like, where do you go get the stuff, right? Do you go to the store or do you go to this guy that's got the address of the store? You know, like how do you go get it? And there were, you know, a number of different ways. We talked about um, PC relative mode, which had to do with an offset off of the incremented program counter. That was the location that you were going to grab stuff from. Indirect mode, I think, was the last one we went through with all the very cool animations, which basically was that you were going to, here we go, that's where we were, um, that you were going to basically go to a certain place that you were kind of given this, this um, you know, uh, you, you do this little addition, get this location. At that location, it's not the, what you're looking for, but it's the address of where to go. It's one hop away, one level of indirection. What we're going to hit right now is uh, the remaining um, uh, addressing modes. We also talked with add and and. Um, we talked about immediate mode, which was another one. That's another addressing mode. And register mode, which was another addressing mode. Okay. Register mode's pretty straightforward, right? When you do an add with a SR1, SR2, both of those are register modes. If you do an add or an and with a register and an immediate value, you're using both modes. You're using register mode because that's where you're getting the first operand, and you're using immediate mode because that's where you're getting the second operand. So as we do these data movements, once again, remember that data movement has to do with I've got stuff in a register and I need to store it away. Or I need to go out to storage and I need to load the register. So storing, I'm putting it in a storage unit. And loading, I'm going to the storage unit, I'm loading my truck to bring it home. Okay? If that helps you to kind of remember this. And if not, remember it's open book. That appendix is given to you when it's exam time. Okay. Alrighty. So base plus offset. Here's how this one works. Um, and... I want to just, let me pull this up as well. 
just to remind you what I'm talking about. Hang on. Okay. This is always given to you. Every exam, it's given to you. It looks like this. And we go, let me make that a little bigger. That's a memory map. That's just terms that, that become an issue. Here comes the instruction set, other notation, just notational convention. Here they come, right here. And notice that whenever you've got base R and on offset, you see it. Um, here it's like base register and the offset is just zero base register with an offset for LDR and base register with an offset for STR, okay? Notice over here, LDR, STR are the ones that use the base plus offset, okay? And then again, they're all in here, okay? So if you have any confusion, if you know that you know it cold, fine, don't look. But if you don't know that you know it cold, like if someone's like, do you know it? And you're like, yeah, I think I got it. And you don't know, you're just toast. You're going to get in there. You're going to think you know what it's doing. You're going to not quite know. And then it's going to cause you a lot of pain and suffering. So just go look it up. And the question I want to ask, you know, ask yourself, if I'm like, so do you understand how LDR works? And we're all nervous about being wrong about something or not knowing something or whatever. And we're like, yeah, yeah, I think I got it. Okay, would you bet a thousand dollars? If you wouldn't bet a thousand dollars, look it the heck up. Okay, look it up. So this is the part that looks just like the little cheat sheet up at the top, right? There's the there's the bit pattern for the opcode. There's a destination register. This is load. There's a base register and an offset, and then it basically just tells you right here. An address is computing, is computed by sign extending bits zero through five, five through zero, these right here, these six bits. You sign extend it, which you know what that is already, to 16 bits. You add that to the value of the contents of the register specified over here. So if that's like, you know, one zero zero, that's register four. Go to register four, pull the contents out, grab this offset six, sign extend it. Add those two together, and then that becomes a pointer. The contents of memory at that address go into the to the destination register. Okay, so that forms the address. I go out to that address, and I bring it and I put the, the contents of, of memory at that address into my destination register. And condition codes are set. Why? Because I wrote to a register. Anytime I write to a register, condition codes get set, okay? If you dig this idea, this connect, this is like a shorthand, right? This says sign extend offset six. This says take base R, and what is that? I can't even, it looks all squiggly. Um, it looks like it's or, that looks like, a, like an or, but I think it's supposed to be a plus sign. But it's all described right here anyway. And then that becomes the pointer into memory. Okay. So here we go. The address of the operand is obtained by adding the sign extended offset six to the value to the contents in the base register. Okay. So here we go. Here's let's walk through it. Here's our instruction. Yeah, we'll do this instruction. So there's there's the LDR opcode 0110. We are going to have um, this first register is the destination register. Back it up. There it is. See? And that next three bits is going to indicate the base register. So what that tells us is we got to go out to register two. We got to get its contents, which is what you see right there. There's register two. Those, those guys right there. That value, which happens to be hex 2345, comes in. This six bits gets sign extended out to 16 bits, which is 001D. Those go into the adder. 
add them together, that pops out as 2362. That goes into the MAR. Then the contents in memory at that location, so that's an address, contents of memory pop out to the MDR, get on the bus, and drop into the destination register, which is R1. Apparently, this is what was there in memory. Okay? That's it. That's it. And one of the things we're going to talk about is some of the, there, all of these different addressing modes can be used to just do certain kinds of programming and assembly that become kind of handy and really underlie a lot of things that you see in higher level languages. Okay. All right. As always, stop me, interrupt me if you have any questions or whatever, but I'm going to just keep going because I got the ghost of Walter and Zach like chasing me to make sure that I keep this thing moving. Uh, I'm not a ghost. I'm here and listening. Ah, crap. So see, ghosts are actually harmless. So, <laughs> Zach and Walter, in contrast, can physically manhandle me. Okay. So therefore, got to go. Got to go. So that is, that's immediate. Sorry, that's base plus offset. Ready? Let's do immediate. Here we go. Immediate mode is funny. I don't like the name. Okay. Just know that I don't like the name. There is one immediate mode uh, instruction called load effective address. And I'm going to do this thing again. Let's go back here. Okay. LEA. Let's go look it up. Get your practice at this. Load effective address. It's a funky, funky thing. Okay. So, um, the way this thing works is um, we compute an address by sign extending uh, this PC offset nine, right? That's nine bits. We sign extend it. We add that to the incremented PC. So load effective address has to be plus or minus the program counter, okay? The And the program counter has already been incremented. Remember, as soon as we fetch it, before we even decode it, we're, we're incrementing it just in case. Okay. But what do we do? We take, so we take the PC, we add this offset, and that is what we put into the destination register. You don't go get the contents. You calculate an address and you save the address. Okay. Remember back here when I was like, oh, there's LDR, right? Where you got to have a base register and the base register has an address in it. How do you do How do you get addresses into registers? Right here with LEA, load effective address. To me, effective has a technical term meaning, but to me it's confusing when you're a novice. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, okay, but basically you take the PC, add the offset, that's now an address. Take that address, put the address in the destination register. For whatever my reasons are, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, that's it. That one, I and what we see a lot of when people struggle is you start to look at their stuff and you're like, there's LDR or there's LD, and they think they're putting the address in to the register, but they're not, you know, or they'll do an LEA, but they think it's a different instruction or whatever. Double check it. You have to know you cannot, this is especially true with, with assembly language with machine language with some high level languages python whatever sometimes you can like you do this thing uh where you just like try a different thing try a different thing and it finally works so you go ah it must be right <clears throat> but you don't actually know why it why it works you're just relieved that it works not not well frankly as a software developer not acceptable you have to know not only that it works but why it works okay you have to have that. In assembly, one of these instructions is wrong and is doing something that was not what you thought it was doing, toast. Okay? And it'll just, because it's like, you know, you like, you write a paper and then you go back and you reread it and you think it's great and then you let somebody else read it and then there's, they find a typo in like your title. You're like, how did I see, you know, how did I, how did I not see that? Well, and the answer is because the, you were macro replacing in your head. You know, you saw that the typo was always being changed every time you read it in your mind. 
Same thing here. You think it means a certain thing and you read it that way every time, but you have to know. The other way you can know, and we'll get to this, is I'm going to do, we ought to do it later on this week, um, a help section specifically about the LC3 uh, simulator, okay? Because I want to get in there. I want you to see the simulator. Get You can just pick it up and start doing it. You don't need a help section on it to do it. But I think for a lot of people, it'll help to kind of demystify it just a little bit. If we take some time, I don't want to necessarily take it right out of lecture time. But for those who need, I think we can definitely do that. And and the principle, the reason I'm kind of saying that is with assembly language, you can see everything. You can see what's in memory at that location, what just got loaded into the register. You know, you're at this point, you make one, you, you execute one instruction and you see what changed. You can track the whole thing, okay? So you can operate in the world of guesswork, okay? Cannot. All right, did we do immediate mode? Oh, no, we didn't do a, yeah, we did immediate mode. Oh, here it is. This is the explanation. So, for example, um, here's an instruction. 1110, that's the LEA opcode. Register 5 is our destination, and that's our offset, which turns out to be negative 3. Okay? Why? How do we know that? We sign extend it, put a bunch of 1s. If you flip all the bits and add 1, look at this. It's going to be all zeros, then it's going to be 1, and then 0. You add one, you get one, one. You can do that in your head and see that that's negative three. So we take that value here, this, this immediate value. We side extend it. We add negative three to this, <clears throat> which gives us this value. And we put that into register five. That's, that's what's happening with immediate value. Immediate mode, I'm sorry. Okay. Are you ready for this? We're going to do an example. We're going to walk through these instructions together. Yes, we are. And I want to just do one quick. Oh, just check time-wise what's coming after this so I can just pace myself because I just know. Oh, the last thing we're going to hit is control instructions. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to do this example for like 10 minutes. Yep. And then we're going to do control instructions, which will be where we wrap up. Probably, maybe touch the next module. That would be great. Okay, so here's what I want to kind of show to you. Uh, this is something that, frankly, when we're in class is a little easier because it's all up on the big projector. And, you know, the only thing I have to do is not write with a dry erase marker on the actual um, screen. That's my main thing I have to worry about. Um, okay, thank you, Brian, for the Nemo GIF. It's uh, making me weirdly happy and also disturbed. I don't know exactly how that works. But here we go. You ready? Once again, I got my big screen this way. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to track along when you've got to be engaged here. You cannot just like sit back, pop the popcorn and just like watch this like a movie. You have got to get engaged to get this. OK, so you got to lean forward a little bit, get out of the beanbag chair. OK, so and a little bit of interactivity would be great either with uh, with uh, audio or with text. First question. Oh. It's too early to be this tired. Okay. What is this first? What is this? What is it? This at location 30F4. I mean, you can see that the numeric value is zero. You can see that. But what is it? Broadly speaking. I'm going to wait for just a second. Can't wait forever. Um, and I'm going to try to wake myself up by just sticking something in my face. <laughs> Texas was eating popcorn. <laughs> oh, man. 
called it, called you out. Busted. Yeah, no, it's okay to eat the popcorn, Texas, but you gotta you do gotta lean forward. Come on, talk to me. What's in three zero F four? Don't make Walter answer this, because I already know he knows. And I know I know. It's like, come on, come on, come on. I beg you, I beg uh, you. Is it just an address that hasn't been assigned yet, or maybe a buffer? Um so it's a location in memory, right? And it's a location at the address 30F4. That's its address. But do we know what it is? Is it, do we have any sense at this point of what that is? Is it an instruction? Is it data? Do we, do we have any idea? What do you think? I'm thinking it's just a number. Like it's just some sort of something there. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, now, you know, it's interesting, you know, it, it could be an instruction and I don't know what the, uh, what the op code is for, uh, for the load. What is the, what is the op code for zero, zero, zero? What is that? Not like I remember it off the top of my head, but we can go up here to the cheat sheet. Uh, branch. All zeros is a branch instruction. So if it were an instruction, which I'm going to, I'm going to say, we don't know that. If it were an instruction, it would be a branch instruction, which we haven't talked about yet. Not really. Okay. Here's the big, here's the big clue, I guess, really. And I, and, and it's okay, by the way, when it's time, um, when it's time to, um, when I'm asking these kinds of questions, just guess, you know, like 90% of the time, the guesses are going to be wrong or a little off or whatever, but it's just part of the engagement. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with taking a stab because I don't expect you to have like all this nailed down. We're still learning, but it kind of gets you engaged. So, um, so definitely, you know, to Matthew can't be a load instruction if it is an instruction. First of all, do we even know if it's an instruction or not? We, you know, and I would, I'm going to say we don't. Um, uh, Matt said just data, right? The P because, okay. So Matt kind of, um, bonus mythical bonus points for matt because the only real clue i've got right now is i've got a program counter right there three zero f6 which points to this guy right there you know it skip it doesn't nothing's pointing to these it points right here to three zero f6 so i'm pretty confident that that's an instruction but i don't know what these are probably data Probably data, you know, they might be instructions, you know, and, and if it is an instruction, like I said, it's one we haven't talked about, you know, it's one we haven't learned, you know, so yeah, just, just to kind of, this is the kind of sort of forensic investigation you have to be a little bit involved in, you know, you can't, the, when you get into real engineering work, real programming, real, you know, when people are paying you to be a software developer, um, they're paying you to figure crap out that people don't already know. And that's a little different than college where we pay you, well, you pay us to figure out crap we already know. It really doesn't look anything like the real world, okay? Um, you know, we have this like set of requirements. So we have a well-known answer, you know, and you're supposed to, sorry, cleaning my glasses, you're supposed to cough up the well-known answer, you know, there's nothing like that in, in industry, nothing like that at all um, in industry. They're not paying you to do something they already know, okay? <laughs> They're paying you to do something that maybe nobody knows, hasn't been done before, okay? So the way you do that is you got to start taking what you do know and start to build little, little clues, little, you know, see what you do know. Now I talked about this a little bit, a little bit before, and I'll talk about it in the next two weeks. We'll talk a little bit about, about the final project and kind of how to think like a, an engineer, think like a developer. Um, 
one of the things that there is a temptation to do, you see this and it looks, you know, we've done all the little things. You're like, okay, okay, I get it. I get it. And then we're like, blech, like this big pile of slop. And you're like, no, it's too many ones and zeros. Like, I don't know. And that first shock kind of hits you because it's just too much, right? Some of you will say, and this was said to me in my first year teaching this, especially the first semester. It kind of shocked me, actually. And the students said, I don't even know where to start. You know, that some of them actually had that accent. Most of them actually did not. But it just feels like an accent I want to use on this one. I don't even know where to start. Um, it, by the way, is the same accent I use when I need to say, I don't want to kill you and you don't want to be dead. You know, I, it's the same accent, basically. But, okay, I just want to say, if the thought comes into your head, I don't even know where to start. Bull crap, okay? Bull crap. It's not true. You don't know how to finish, but frankly, looking at this right now, neither do I. You think, you know, it's not like this is a well known thing that everybody's supposed to know these patterns. You know, no, no. Nobody knows how to finish, really. Nobody knows where you're going next, but you do know how to start, okay? Does that make sense? You do know how to start. So I don't even know how to start is hyperbole and it's wrong. It's false. Unless you literally just dropped into this YouTube, you know, broadcast by accident, or you were gone since January and you just now showed up going, thought I might try to pass this class now. Yeah, you might not know where to start. What Matt did was one way to try to start. Well, where is the PC? PC is at 30F6 right there. Okay. So what are the things ahead of it, above it? I don't know and I don't care. Short answer. I mean, the short answer is I don't know. The longer answer is and I don't care. Not now. And and they're kind of zeros. If they're a number, they're a zero. You know? Okay. So we go here to 30F6. And by the way, this bad boy. Oh, yeah. Animated. Animated. Let's look at it now. You gotta have, you gotta have um, this thing kind of hanging out a little bit. I gotta shrink it just to, just to get this thing to fit. Okay, and and hopefully, it's just a there's a, there's a space issue. Okay, at some level we run out of space to put everything, including the reference material. Okay, but let's take a look. Uh, 1110. Let's go look at it again. Apologies, but bring up, pull up your own. You know, if you're on your laptop, pull up your own uh, little cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. Okay, 1110 is um, load effective address. Okay, now if you're going to go through these slides on your own, what you need to do now is go look it up, go review that, read it. Because what's here's what's going to happen. Load effective address says that we take the PC offset. We take the PC, which is 30F6. We take this value, which is an immediate value, which is negative three. We add negative three to the program counter. That's what this little note here says. Program counter minus three, whatever that is, we put it into R1, okay? Where are you? Oh, the other thing notice that I did here, we're at 30F6, increment the program counter. So the program counter got incremented first thing. The next thing that happens is we take the program counter minus three, which is what this instruction says to do. It says subtract three from the program counter, put the result into register one. Boom, right there. Notice 30F4, 30F4. It's that minus three. Okay, so there we just did an, a load effective address. Next one, notice the uh, program counter is already incremented. So now it's pointing at this one. Okay, oh, we increment the program counter first thing and now it says F8. All right, now this one, by the way, I don't even think you need to look it up. 
What is zero, 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 one? Come on, come on. Yeah, we're going to do an ad. Ad. Ad, baby, that's the one. We beat the heck out of it. Ad. So we got one. And then what do we got? We got uh, destination register two. Uh, right, source register one. Bit five is on. So this is an immediate value. Positive or negative? You know, immediately it's positive because the leftmost bit. It's a five-bit twos complement number. Leftmost bit is a zero. I sign extend with zeros. It's a positive number. Happens to be 14, right? Ones, twos, fours, eights. Eight plus four is 12, plus two is 14. So I take whatever's in register one, which is that thing I just put there. I add 14 to it. And I put the result into R2. Ready? Boom, R2 right there. We could break that down into more painful detail, but you got the idea, right? Now, can I just pause for a second? Of course I can, because I'm talking. Just think for a second. If you're if you're here and you're if you're here and you're lost, you gotta hit me and, and Walter and Zach. Grab us, you know, get get a little more help. Go back, rewatch videos. Okay. But if you're tracking, if you're tracking, which is I think most of you, I'm pretty confident it's most of you. And you're tracking, think about January when we first started going like transistor blah. And just understand how confusing all of it kind of was when we first started. And now we're right here going, okay, bip, 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 bip. It's a lot of stuff. And we're just kind of popping. It's just, pop you, you hear the popping? We're just popping like, like uh, who's thinking popcorn? In Texas is popcorn. <laughs> okay. No, but you know what I mean? Just think about how far you've come. Think about how far you've come in like 10 weeks of doing this stuff. Kind of amazing. And I say that to just try to help you with a little confidence to say that you really can do this thing. You really can do it. It's a matter of sticking with it, staying staying exposed to it. It's got to happen every day. Okay, keep going. Next instruction is going to be in 30F8, right? There we go, 30F8. Okay, what is it? 0011. Let's pull it up and look it up. For those like on a phone or can't look it up, uh, 0011. That's a store, right? It's a store instruction. Store instruction has a source register. Remember, I'm storing a value from a register into memory. Okay? That's what store does. Source value is register two. So there we go. That's register two. So that contents, that's the source register. And we got ourselves, we got ourselves an immediate value. It is a PC offset nine, right? Yeah. All right. So what's that number? What's that number? Well, if we flipped all the bits and added one, we'd get all zeros. Then we get one zero zero. Okay. So if we had one zero zero, ignore my pinky. It's always a risk. There's always an obscene gesture in some culture about to happen. One, zero, zero. I add one, I get one, zero, one. That's five. This is apparently Dr. K sign language for five. It's also flipping somebody off in like Klingon or something. I don't know. But you can see that's five, right? Uh, is that right? Did I do that right? One, zero, zero plus one would be five. So it's negative five. Yeah. Oh, here's why I was confused. That that PC gets incremented first thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the source register. Sorry, I'm going to take whatever's in register two. And where am I going to put it? PC plus this offset. The offset's negative five. So three zero F nine minus five is three zero F four. There it is in our little notes. The notes are just pseudocode. They just reminders. Okay. 
So that little M just kind of goes in memory at this address, 30F4. I'm going to take the contents of register two and I'm going to put it there. Okay, we look and we're like, oh, there's 30F4 right here. Let's do it. Notice register two, that is now here. Okay. Cool, right? Or not, right? But maybe cool, right? Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. Right. Um, so the before, what was it? It was just a placeholder, I guess, for this information. What was 30F4? Yes, was, correct. Um, yeah, it was just a location in memory. It, it could have been a place that... Um, I mean, typically you could think of it, the easiest, cleanest way to think of it is like, we made this variable that we just called like X. And we said, X is an integer. And then the compiler went, oh, let's just put that right there at 30F4. I'm dramatically oversimplifying the process by which a variable winds up with an address in memory. But the concept, right? It's like, that's a variable location. You know, so is it overriding some piece of data then? Whatever was there before is toast at this point. Always. Okay. And it doesn't matter what was there before because we, we didn't care about it then. And so now we just know that it's just a placeholder with that information that we want. That's right. This is the okay. this is the social contract that as pro as the yeah. programmer, we decided we don't care. You know, if we'd cared, you know, we, we probably would have acted differently just there, you know. So we just overwrite stuff all the time. If I don't care about so it. So how do? So uh, how did we know to put it in three zero F four? That's where we wanted to put it. Okay. And I don't. And that. And I hope Gabe, that was not intended to be flippant. Okay. I mean, it's like literally. I don't know. We just decided. Oh, you know what? I'm going to have these two words in memory at three zero F four and three zero F five. They're my little local variable storage. I'll start my little routine here at 30 f6 so i'll start below them they're not you know we're not executing those we're not running those right and then i'll just like store value almost like like having a spare register only it's in memory you know save it away later on if i need to go get it i can get it makes sense i'm pretty sure he's like asking like how did we get to 30 f4 is that right gabe yeah, like why specifically? Like, because we went from uh, three zero F eight, and we completed that, and then it we stored it in three zero F four. I was wondering, or uh, yeah, I was wondering just why specifically did it go there? Was it a part okay. of the code? I just didn't see. Yeah, yeah. So what we've got here is a store instruction, right? Was that store zero zero one one? Was it ST? I think it was. Double check. Double yeah. check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 0011 is ST. And the way ST works, um, hang on really quick, let me get that back. The way ST works is it says, take the incremented program counter and add to it whatever is in here, this immediate value. And that becomes the location where you're going to put the contents of the register indicated right here. Make sense? Okay, gotcha. I get right? that now. So therefore we take, and the key is, right, it has to be, when I'm there, it's 30F8. I fetch that instruction, then I increment the program counter. So while 30F8 is actually running, the program counter is 30F9, because it got incremented before we even ran. 30F8. Then I take this number, which is negative five. I add it to that number, which is 30F9. I get 30F4. And that's how the, the computer decided, oh, here's where I'm going to put the contents of register two. That makes sense, Gabe? Yeah, thank you. You bet. 
And so now that there's information there, we know that it's not an instruction. Whereas before we didn't, we weren't quite sure it could have been an instruction. Yeah. Yeah. Now there is one little kind of funky dicey thing, which is really bad programming practice, but can be done. I can also don't ever do this. Now do this for fun if you feel like it, but there was a thing back in the day when memory was so constrained when you had like, 256 bytes of memory, whatever, whatever, you know what I mean? 1K of memory, where there was a programming trick called self-modifying code, where you would literally change the code itself so that you could rerun the same code, only now the code would be different because you changed it. I'm saying it's a nope. thing, and I'm saying, please, you know, for the love of all we hold sacred... Don't ever do this in a professional setting. It's impossible to debug, basically. So you would take like 30F6 to 30F9 and have all of those instructions be modifying the previous instructions and then go to 30F6 and 30F9 again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was really a thing. It was on, it was, it predates my programming time, right? My, my, professional programming time kind of starts in the 80s and so it was kind of a 60s and 70s thing but it was called self-modifying code that was what it was called and it's just it's just it's a demon from the abyss you know what i mean but it was it was at times you know really critical but it and the reason i even share that apart from the fact that it's just sort of like weird and creepy but funny at the same time is to just understand that if I wanted to make this an instruction and then change and then jump to it, I could. I don't recommend it because once again, what does that mean? You know, it means whatever we want it to mean, however pathologically we want it to mean, whatever we want it to mean. It's all, you know, and, uh, because memory is just memory. And sometimes you get into situations where you're like writing data and then your code's wrong. And you literally start overwriting code because you can. You're free to overwrite code. And then your program just hangs because the whole thing just goes eh, and it's not doing anything. Okay. So just to understand, I can put whatever I want wherever I want it, even if it's really a bad idea. Okay. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah. Are LDR and um, LEA both control instructions? They're data movement instructions. Because they're both oh, about, they're, and, and, and conversely with the store equivalents of those as well, right? They are, take a thing and put it there, go out to memory and get a thing and bring it here. They're, they're that kind of data movement. The control instructions are the branch and the jump, basically, and some subroutine things that we'll talk about. Does that make sense, Josh? Yeah, thank you. Hopefully, it helps with some bingo somewhere along the line. Um, okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. We're on a roll. Okay. I now go to 30F9. I fetch it. As soon as I fetch it, boom, I increment the program counter. This one... 0101. Anybody off the top of their head? That's an AND instruction? It's one of our old friends, yeah. So, my old friend. 0101, that's AND. Okay. So, we're going to AND. What are we doing? We got bit 5 as a 1, which means we got an immediate value as our second operand and, and a, a register for our first operand. So, we're going to take register 2. And we are going to AND it with zero. And zero is going to get sign extended. What's going to happen to register to this, to this value? I take register two, pull the value out. I AND it with all zeros. What happens to that value? Pins to zero because none of them are going right. to be. Blows up, right? Blows up everything. And then I've so now basically got zero. And where am I putting that? Register two. What am I doing so in effect? I am just putting Placing a zero. Every... Yeah, I'm just yeah. putting a zero in register two. Okay. 
Uh, where are we? Right there. Did that not go red? Come on, I've lost. Oh, there we go. There we go. There's the red. It's like here, and then it goes right there. There's my animation. So that was register two, just hanging out, not bothering anybody. And then we just go, yeah, why don't you take that value? And by the way, you could take any register and it was zero and stick it in register two and it would have the same effect. Okay. Boom. Now I've got, let's go to three zero FA, increment the program counter. All right. What's this one doing? Oh, we're back to an add, another add instruction. Take register two, add to it five, the, the, the literal value five, the immediate value five. That's what this is showing, R2 plus five. There's R2, which is currently all zeros. Add, add five to it and put it back into R2, boom. Now these two steps are basically one way, like I need the value five in R2 and I don't know what R2 has right now. What am I gonna do? Well, clear it and add five is a pretty handy schnazzy way to do that. To get me a five, I need me a five in R2. I'm gonna clear it, add five, boom. Got a five in R2. So that's so one. Why and by the way, stuff previously. What's that, Matt? Matthew? Why all this stuff previously if you're just gonna blow it up and add five? Uh, just as an example program that makes no sense okay. per se. No, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to what this thing is doing. It's just like, oh, like try to think logically, and we're no. like putting the value in register one into. Nah, it, nah, it's just like oh, sandbox time. You know, like when you strap firecrackers to the little army men and pile dirt all around everything. That was what we did in the 70s, you know, when uh, we, we were free range children. Um, anyway, it was just like, there's no rationale. <clears throat> I don't know, you know. The little, the little green army men are resilient. They're going to be fine. Um, no, you know, it's a, it's a great question. Why are we doing this? No freaking clue. Um, okay, but let's keep going. Great question. Uh, go to FB, 30 FB, increment the program counter. But this is it. This is, this is, we are manually walking through an actual program. And if we took these ones and zeros and put them into the LC3 simulator, it would do the very same thing. We could set this all up and just walk it on through. Okay, zero, one, one, one. More of this absurd madness. Zero, one, one, one. What is it? Oh, STR. That's a base plus offset. See it? There's the base, there's the offset, zero, one, one, one. Okay, so here's what I do. Um, and it is a, hang on, what did we say? It's a store, which means we're taking the contents of something and we're putting the contents of a register into memory, okay? It's exactly analogous, converse, converse but analog analogous to the load equivalent. Okay, but this one's a store. So here's what I do. Um, I'm gonna what's what's the register with the contents? Old good old register two, which has done a lot of hard work today. Yeoman's work there for R2, uh, which is the which is so that's two. That's this right here, this value five. And what are we gonna do? The question is where are we gonna put it? And the answer is the base register plus um, this immediate value, which is 14, right? Eight plus four plus two plus zero. So I take the contents of R1, which is this value right here, three zero F uh, four, three zero F four, right? We're doing this thing right. We add 14 to it. And what is that going to be? Now, this one's kind of funky because when we take 30F4 and we add 14 to it, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and it goes off the screen because just space. Okay? So we're writing it to a space down there a little ways. That's all. Okay? Now, interestingly, I think what's actually going to happen here is that if we go to let's let's do this thing real quick because I'm 
trying to remember how clever I was. If we start with 3, 0, F4, we add 14. You go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I got six more to do. So I got F, D, F, E, F, F, 3, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. Okay? That's the location. 3, 1, 0, 2. Notice what the value is I shoved over here earlier. 3102 is just magically hanging out. This is, in fact, now holding the address of where I just put that data. How convenient. All right, here's what we do. We grab this last one. 1010, zero, one, zero, what is it? I have no idea. Let's go look. LDI, load indirect. Load indirect. Okay, how's load indirect go? There's a destination register and a PC offset nine. Remember how this thing works? No, let's review it. Okay, so I start with this PC offset nine. Flip all the bits and I get zeros. Then it goes one, zero, zero, one. Sorry, sorry. One, zero, 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 and I add one. It gives me one zero zero zero, which is nine, right? Is that nine in decimal? One, two, four, eight. Yeah, eight and nine. So I go backwards. Sorry, the incremented program counter. I go backwards nine from the incremented program counter, which would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the answer of program counter plus that PC offset. It's right over here, cheat sheet, 3F04. I go, now this is LDI, load indirect, okay? So I go to this location, I pull this value out, but that's not my answer, it's an address. So I then go to 3102, which is off the screen, and go there and grab whatever's there, which we already know what it is. It's the value five, and I'm gonna put it in register three, ready? Oh yeah, there we go. So in answer to whoever asked the question earlier, this entire program uh, puts the value of register two into register three, apparently. I don't know, right? I don't know, right? You're a poet and you didn't realize it. Oh, you're killing me. Okay, yeah, that's right. Is is there kind of more rhyme and reason to having so many um, opcodes relate to the program counter, like do things kind of relatively since that's always changing? Seems a bit unlogical to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's a really good question. But let's, in fact, one way to sort of address that is let's take a peek. I think it's a really, I think it's a really good question. Um, here's the thing. Looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost half of the instructions are PC relative, right? There's some, there's some math around the program counter. Um, it's not really illogical per se. It's just nearby, right? Like, for example, 30F4 over here, I can reference 30F4 from any instruction nearby by just having a PC offset. And that offset's going to be different in every instruction because the distance to get to that location is going to be different for every instruction. You know, So the offsets are, are going to be different, but they might all refer back to the very same instruction. Sorry, memory location. So would it be kind of common to track where the PC counter is inside of your program? Um, well, keep in mind, no, no, because keep in mind that this is when you when you're writing this code. This is all static. Your program is static. And when I say let's just say that three zero F four, we decided was a variable location called X or I, right? 
then everywhere that I say PC offset, whatever, and it refers to that location, would be like in Python just referring to I or in any other high level language, just saying I. Oh, you meant that location. Down underneath, it might say, oh, that's pretty close by. I can save some space. If I do a PC offset, it's just got to be close by. And then I then when I need to go far away, I've got to do base registers and stuff that allow me to jump kind of everywhere. You know what I mean? I can access with a base register, I can access memory anywhere in the memory, but it's a little clunky because I got to start by getting an address into the base memory, uh, base register. With PC offset, I can do it with fewer assembly instructions or fewer machine language instructions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's really about how much work it takes to get there. And all these PC things are super, there's one instruction, bam, I'm there. But if I'm trying to access memory somewhere else, I've got to go set it up, get the thing out of the symbol table, pull it in, get it there, then do base plus offset. You know, you know what I mean? There's a few more steps to do it. So it's really a question of convenience and size and convenience because everything is close by versus more cumbersome because everything's far away. That's it. It sounds like we don't actually set the offset. It's done for us automatically. When you, okay, yeah, that's actually a really good question. When you're writing in assembly language, you reference a location and the assembly, the assembler calculates that offset and sticks that in there for you. When you're coding in machine language, which is what you're gonna do next, I apologize in advance. Sorry, not sorry. You gotta calculate it yourself. But the but in assembly language, it'll calculate it for you. We like assembly then. <laughs> we like assembly, exactly. Exactly. Because if I because with assembly language, I can use labels, put a label on that thing, call it I. Then I can just say, yeah, I want to put that value over there in I. And then the assembly will just go, oh, that's PC offset minus nine. And it'll set it up for you. When you're coding in machine language, you have to mess with this crap. That's why we had to go make assembly language really fast. After we had machine language, we had to go make assembly. Language. And that is the bridge really between machine language and what comes very next, which is assembly language. Okay. Okay. And in our remaining, yeah, yeah. Hit me, Matt. What happens when it goes to 3102? When what because goes to 3102? The PC. Oh, if because it does, I've... it'll try to execute it. If it ever does. Okay. But it won't. I mean, well, we could later on jump to 30 to, to, uh, Oh, you're saying when it gets down to 3102, like off the page? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So here's the key. Here's the key to that. If we're doing that and that's really data down there, like another uh -huh. I, you know, or X or what, some variable, um, you probably, before you get there, better jump out of there. Better get out of there. You know what I mean? So you're just like executing and somewhere before you get there, you've either got to like, if there's a little bit of stack of some data going on there, you probably want to like branch around it, then keep going or jump and all the way somewhere else. Like jump and make sure that you're not accidentally low. Like you're not actually executing something that is not supposed to be executed. Exactly. Exactly. Cause it'll do it dutifully, you know? Uh, I mean, and okay. almost, almost anything you can do with random data can be interpreted as an instruction. You know, you can run the experiment yourself, right? All right. You just have to start by saying, oh, there's the op code. How do I interpret the rest of it? And it'll just interpret it. And as long as it can do it, it'll do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, before we move on, can we just go over that last um, instruction just one more time? Yeah, Josh. This one is, this one, if I remember correctly, was LDI. Load in direct, is that right? Yeah. Uh, LDI 1010. Yeah, yeah. So the way load in direct, and, and load in direct is maybe the trickiest one. 
okay? Because it's got that indirection, right? I'm going to give you the address. You're going to go to that address. What you're going to find at that address is not what I sent you for, but another address. You're going to then take that and go to that address where you'll find the thing that I sent you for. That's really what's going on here. So we go load indirect and load indirect going back has PC offset nine. Okay. That's where everything starts. So we go, uh, the incremented PC is three zero FD. The value here is negative. What did we say? Negative nine. We take three zero FD. We subtract nine from it. That gives us 3F04, which means we're going to first go look right here in 30F4. But that's not what we're looking for. That's the address of what we're looking for. And that happens to say 3102. So I'm going to go to 3102 off the page, which has the number five sitting there. I'm going to go to that location, get what's there, pull it out, and then be like, where was it supposed to go again? Oh, yeah, register three. Boink, put it in register three. Does that make sense, Josh? Is that feeling a little bit better? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank okay. you. And, and by the way, you know, after another hour from now, plus a little popcorn, um, this will also fade. <laughs> so you got to hit it again, okay? You got to come back to it again and, and hit it again, okay? It's not good enough just like, oh, you got it, now it sticks forever. Probably not. Okay. Great questions, by the way. Really, really great questions. I really appreciate it. We're going to hit control instructions. And as always, we're going to come back to these things. They're going to be reviewed again and again. There are not that many control instructions. Um, there are five that have opcodes. Okay. There is a conditional branch, an unconditional jump. And those are the ones we really care about right now. And later on, we're going to talk a bit more about subroutine calls, which are also, you can think of as function calls. We Anciently, they were called subroutine calls. Trap instructions and return from interrupt, okay? Um, and when we talk about subroutines, that re anyway, the return stuff, there's a few things going on there. Um, there's RET and RTI that are both basically returns from functions. But there's a little bit, I'm not going to, focus a lot right now on those bottom three. I really want to focus on the conditional branch and the unconditional jump, okay? The conditional branch basically just says, well, let me check the condition codes based upon the condition. Remember, the condition codes get set every time you write a value to a, to a register. The condition codes get set. Conditional branch just says, uh, why don't you look at this code and if that one's set, remember there are three of them, N, Z, P, right? Which is you've got you've got negative, you've got zero, you've got positive, right? Those are the three control codes. And I can say, if it's negative or zero, uh, then I want to take the jump. If it's not, then I don't. That's always what the branch is doing. You tell me which condition code you care about. If any of the ones you said you cared about are actually set, then I'll jump wherever you told me to jump, okay? The, the unconditional jump just kind of goes, go here now, boom, okay? Anywhere in memory. And we'll walk through these. All right. So here's the branch instruction. Also, we can call it the conditional branch, but it's the branch instruction. Um, it's a PC offset again. The PC offset tells us where we're going to jump if the condition's true. If, if we're going to jump, that's where. So again, we're only nine bits. So, you know, what is that? Plus or minus two to the eighth, give or take, right? So I can go forward or backward two to the eighth. Two to the eighth is, do you remember? Um, let's go back to two to the fifth is 32, two to the sixth, 64, seven, one, uh, 128, sorry, eight, 256. 
So I can go forward 255 or backwards 256. Memory locations. That's not a big jump, right? That's that's moving around. That's not a big jump. Um, and remember these control codes, N, Z, and P. Now, the branch instruction has its own bits called N, Z, and P. There were control codes called N, Z, and P. But now the branch instruction has, has its own bits called N, Z, and P. Okay, well, they're called the same thing. Usually the, the, the registers are with lowercase and the bits are uppercase, but it's pretty arbitrary. What you need to remember is that if I throw a zero here, it says, don't look at the N bit, don't care. Don't look at the Z bit, don't care. Do look at the P bit, I do care. That basically says branch on positive, right? What if I say, what if I say one, one, one for those three bits? What's the effect? Jump? Would that just be like an unconditional jump? Unconditional because... jump. Yeah, exactly right. Because one of the three, you know, condition codes has to be set every single time. If you say, well, if the first one, like there's three bits and one of them is going to be on by definition. And you're like, if the first one's on or if the second one's on or if the third one's on, I want to branch. Okay. What did you just build? You just built an unconditional jump out of a branch statement with a, with a smaller distance and without having to set up a register to tell you where to jump to. So it's easier, more convenient. So you can do an absolute jump with a branch statement. No problem. What about if you go zero, zero, zero? Just don't jump. Don't do anything. Really? Right? <laughs> I mean, there's, if it's like zero, it's like, don't look at N. How about Z? No, I'm not. No, don't look at Z. How about P? No. Okay. So you don't actually want me to do anything, correct? Apparently correct. And we sometimes refer to this as a no-op. And a no-op, there are some assembly uh, languages where they'll literally define a no-op. It'll basically just be the number zero, but it'll be like, the branch instruction, which is all zeros, the condition codes, zeros, and for good measure, everything else just be zero because it doesn't matter. And we just call it a no-op because it, it no operation. It doesn't do anything. Professor, what's the point of it? Did you call me professor? Who said uh, this? Excuse me, Dr. K. Gomez, go. <laughs> student, my student, bad. how dare you? You dare incur my wrath. Okay, no, what? I'm sorry, go ahead. Not the minute. hand. <laughs> Not uh, the hand. Not the hand. So okay, talk Dr. to me. Dr. K, uh, if we have an instruction that doesn't do anything, why does it exist? <laughs> like, why do we put it in there? Okay, so the actual answer to that is there's a couple, there's really, I don't know, just a couple reasons. Sometimes you know that you need to add something later and you want to reserve the ability to like patch the binary. So you just put a bunch of no ops that later on you can put real instructions in by literally patching the binary. That's a thing. The other thing is in the middle of a loop, the only thing that you really, that the no op really does for you is burns time, right? It's going to just take the cost of, of doing a fetch, you know, it's going to fetch it. It's going to decode it. It's not going to do anything. And then it's just going to grab the, you know, and then it's going to fetch again. That operation takes a, a known amount of time. So you can build timing loops out of these. It's like, don't do anything, but definitely take three milliseconds or three microseconds to do it. Stand there for a little bit and then- And what would be the benefit to that? Uh, sometimes you actually have to set timers, you know, where you're just like, sometimes there are systems that'll give you a timer, but sometimes you have to do your own. You just spin off a little thread over there that just goes, buzzes for a while because you just need to set a little timer to like check every minute to do something or something you can also set up timers okay. there's other ways of doing timers i'm just saying sometimes there's just a little bit of timing that i need it to just wait like it always takes 10 microseconds for this one thing to happen 
but I want to read and I know that that's always going to happen. So I can just set up a little loop to do nothing. Just literally set up a no op with a loop. And it's just going to go brrr, do nothing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead and grab, you know, the, 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 you can go ahead and look at that data or, or check the sensor or whatever. The really handy thing about NOOP is the way that you can use it as secret code when referring, for example, to team members who don't pull their weight or coworkers who are known to accomplish nothing while drawing a paycheck. I give you permission socially, morally, ethically. <laughs> no, you're on your own on the, other, you're on your own. But you know, sometimes it's just like, whatever that that's, or a certain thing. Well, that's a bit of a no op. You know, it's it makes me do a thing, but it doesn't accomplish anything. Burns time and does nothing else. No op. Spelled N O P. Spelled N O P. Okay. So as long as the first seven bits, uh, the first seven bits are all zero, we don't care about the other nine bits. That that's right. could all be one, and it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Does it? Because it's never gonna. There's, we're never gonna take the branch. Now you know the. Uh, what's interesting is thirty one oh two that we were doing earlier. Since it's all zeros and at the end one oh one, even if the machine had gotten to that point, it wouldn't have done anything. That's right. That's right. It would have just skipped on past, and it would have gone okay, and then just gone to the next line, which I think stayed zeros, and it would have executed that as doing nothing, and would have gone to the next line. It wouldn't have been any harm. If you had tried to run it. Cool. Cool. Um, okay. Now, and we're going to do, by the way, oh yeah, animation. We're going to do the animation here in a sec. <clears throat> so let's just say the last value we loaded into a red GPR, general purpose register. Last value we loaded into a register was zero. So in the LC3, the Z code is set on and the others are off. Okay, N is off, P is off, Z is on, okay? Here's the current instruction address, 4027. The PC is at 4028. We take this instruction, which is 0D9, positive number. We add those together. That's the incremented program counter. 4 is 101. With this instruction, because we said, yeah, check the Z bit. And we go, yep, the Z bit is set. And you've got to separate. You've got to separate the fact that there are these three bits in hardware. And then there's these three bits in the branch instruction. And the three bits in hardware happen, get set every time a value is written to a register. And one of the three, it's like a radio button. One of the three is on. Always one and only one. The three bits down in the branch instructions say, which ones do I care about? But a lot of times they'll look the same. The Z bit up there is set, the Z bit down here is set. But they're not the same thing. This one just says, if that Z bit got set, I want a branch. But it might not be set, in which case like, ah, uh, nope. And it turns out we can build all kinds of decision-making stuff with just this conditional branch and those condition codes. It's amazing. Okay, let's do this one. And then what I want to do, we'll come back to this one. Zach and Walter will manhandle me just a little bit, but we're so close. Sorry, Walter. <laughs> uh, but I want to do this real quick, and there's no animation on this, but this is our setup. Branch, and we only care about the Z bit in this instance. I only care about the Z bit. There's my offset, 0D9. Okay, there's the program counter. Here's my offset coming out of the, there's the instruction register right there. I take that PC offset, sign extend it. I take the PC, I add those together. They drop into this multiplexer. Now this is the key. I then say, do I care about the end bit? No, that end bit over in the hardware just happens to already be zero, but I don't care. Do I care about the P bit? No. Do I care about the Z bit? Yes. I do care about it. Let's go look at the actual hardware. Yes, that's just an AND gate. What I say I care about, 
for each of n, z, and p, and what's actually set. If they're both the same, they're both on, boom, I got an or here and I get yes, which says yes, take the branch. That kind of kicks over here into this PC multiplexer. It basically says the PC multiplexer just kind of goes, do I want to leave the PC alone? It's already been incremented, by the way. Do I want to leave it alone? Or do I want to overwrite it with this value that's coming right now out of the adder? This system right here of these three bits ended with these three bits gives me the answer of whether I'm going to overwrite the PC or leave it alone. If it's yes, then I overwrite. And that value, which is, you know, that value plus this value happens to be this, gets written right into the program counter. It blows away whatever was in the program counter. Toast. And now what happens next? Fetch, decode, execute. On the next cycle around, the control unit goes, oh, let me grab what's in the, in the PC. Go out there, grab that thing. And I just effectively, I just teleported to a different place by changing the value in the PC. Boom, change the value in the, in the PC, you teleport. If you don't change the value in the PC, uh, then the PC's already been incremented and you're just going, go, go, go. Just keep grabbing the next one, next one, next one. Does that make sense? Or even if it doesn't? Okay. What's that? Wait, say it again, Matthew. Uh, you figured out the secret to teleportation, Dr. K. Within very narrow contexts, but yes. It is kind of magic, right? Really. You're like, Brr, and you're like, oh, if the following things are true, I'd like to just execute somewhere else. And it's like, yeah, it is true. How am I going to get, how am I going to make the program start running over there? Easy. What's the program? What do I want the value over there to be? Put it in the program counter. Done. That's crazy. That's kind of cool. Okay. So here's where we are. My friends, we are basically almost done. We still have to talk about the jump instructions. That was the branch instruction. And when we come back, just checking the, the, the PowerPoint stuff. We're going to hit the jump instruction. And... We'll touch the trap instruction and we'll do a little bit of an example and we'll be done within Walter um um 20 minutes. Within 20 minutes, we're on to the next module next time. I promise. I swear. I swear it. But for now, we're done. We're a wee bit over time. But I shall see you all on Thursday. Uh, again, crank it, crank it, crank it. Do not fall behind. Okay, I'm shutting everything down. Thanks, Dr. K. You bet. Take care, everybody.